seconds. My name's Ryan Fox. Uh, my presentation is on the death of Microsoft. Um, it's not Linux, it's certainly not Apple. Um, the solution for killing Microsoft isn't another OS, it's taking the, that platform dominance away from them. Um, and that's what I'm going to talk about today. Does anybody work for Microsoft here? Anybody? Don't be embarrassed. Okay, we're just going to bash the shit out of them. <laughs> Um, I'm just some guy talking. I don't have any special qualifications that say, okay, this is why I think Microsoft is uh, going to die and why I'm qualified to say that, but I have the Microsoft microphone and you don't, so you're going to listen to me. Butt nozzle. Ha ha ha. Laugh, laugh, laugh. Okay. So, why are we talking about this? This affects all of computing. This is the most important thing that that any of us can deal with because Microsoft is the richest, most powerful company in the history of the world. Uh, when they're going to, when they collapse, it's going to be something that's studied in business classes and dissected to death. It'll be a turning point in, in computing and really modern civilization. It's like Rome falling. Uh, so let's go through some past threats to, to Microsoft. Uh, say early 1980s, what, what threatened Microsoft? Anybody? Anybody? Bueller? Apple. That was their, their first big threat. They you know, had to fight against Apple. Uh, <coughs> and really it was you know, their biggest battle. They didn't have that market dominance to, to just brush everyone aside. It was uh, <coughs> a fight to the death. Um, Apple, you know, put up a great fight. Does anyone have a, a good reason of why Microsoft won that? What's that? IBM. IBM. Um, yeah, having, you know, IBM in the, the, the corner um, certainly helped. Open systems and everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah, open systems, you know, tend to, to beat out the proprietary. Uh, another big thing, and kind of related to IBM, is that in 1984, nobody bought a home computer that didn't use the exact same thing at work. And you know, Microsoft and IBM were terrific about developing business software. And near as I can tell, that's the biggest reason that the Microsoft won. And they really weren't threatened until uh, late 90s. There was. WordPerfect, some other applications, but really Microsoft just grabbed computing by the cojones and <clears throat> had their way with us. Now, 1997, or late 90s, there was uh, a big revolution, maybe you've heard of it, called the Internet. Now, <clears throat> the biggest threat to Microsoft in that was Netscape, or so they thought. Uh, Netscape, you know, through NCSA and Mosaic and finally Netscape, built a great browser which was, you know, the great content delivery mechanism for the internet and of course the internet's wonderful. Uh, <coughs> and, you know, Microsoft fought dirty and, and uh, succeeded with Internet Explorer, but it really ended up that the browser just isn't that important. It's the delivery mechanism, but the content is the thing with the value. Uh, earlier against Apple, it was platform versus platform, but with uh, Microsoft versus Netscape, it was a platform versus an application. Uh, you know, at the introduction of the internet, 1997, early 90s, even, uh, or late 90s, early 2000, if you ask someone to choose between having their web browser or the rest of their desktop applications, you would choose the desktop applications. 
And that's something that, that really isn't uh, as prevalent today. It, it's kind of flip-flopped. You know, what's important? Well, if I had to choose, I'd choose my web browser. Everything that I can do on the desktop, I can do through the web browser if I absolutely have to. Um, and it's worth mentioning when it's, you know, 2001-ish, Department of Justice has given up on Microsoft and the Internet Explorer debacle. But <clears throat> why hasn't Linux succeeded? Anyone? I'm not going to throw stuff at you. Ponytails and sandals? Well, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, to, to random jade computing person, look at, uh, you know, who's developing an operating system, and there's, you know, the extension of Big Blue, there's Microsoft uh, versus, you know, some guy in, in sandals. There's, uh, I can understand that. Uh, one, of the, one of the things I wrote down was, Linux is too tough for idiots. You know, it, it's one thing for us to use Linux, but, you know, it, Whenever I hear somebody talk about, hey, I switched this person over to Linux, it's that they switch them over for this one specific task. And if they try to vary outside of that specific task, they can't do it. You know, uh, maybe Linux peaked a bit too early. Um, you know, newer, very friendly distros um, <clears throat> are, are a lot more easy for you know, total idiots to use. Um, you know, back in 2001, when Linux became popular with the mainstream me media, um, you know, if you wanted to set Linux up on your computer, you probably needed to know what video card you had and what sound card you had, and you know, everybody in this room can certainly do that, but our grandmas can't. So that's something I wrote down for for why Linux never succeeded in, in really displacing Microsoft. I mean. The battle isn't all the way over, but uh, I, I just can't imagine Linz pulling it out without, you know, assassinating Bill Gates and doing some other stuff. So, what can displace it? Um, this is the only time I'm going to use this term, so listen carefully. Web 2.0. Okay, I, I won't ever say that again because it's such a horrible term. Uh, it, nobody really has a good definition for it. It's, it seems like a marketing thing. So I'm not going to talk about it anymore. But this, that's web technology stuff. Um, has a, 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 a fighting chance at displacing Microsoft. So if nobody has a good definition for it, what is it? Um, it's certainly not a technology like JavaScript. It's not even a collection of technologies like Ajax or LAMP is. It's really a collection of collections of technology. It's the things like social components, remixable data sources, uh, software as a service, user controlled data, and really the, the concept that <clears throat> any NetSpeed internet application has more value the more people use it. Uh, BitTorrent, MySpace, uh, all those things, e eBay, have more value the more people use it. Uh, traditional applications don't scale that way. Uh, has anybody noticed the similarity between blogs and GeoCities? Just everybody has a blog, and GeoCities from like 1990-95, it was just a, a random collection of everybody that wanted to, to put out their content, sort of like podcasting. Uh, <coughs> the, the real difference that the added technology is that blogs put it into chronological order. Just like podcasting, where if you wanted to see like the newest thing, you know, with a blog, you go to it, the newest is at the top, you can see it. And, and that's the only difference between that and, and GeoCities. Uh, so it, it's interesting to think about one little change like that, how it can, can revolutionize a, a whole technology. Uh, so some of the, the newer Web 2.0 apps that, that are coming out, uh, 
you know, Ajax Write is just terrific. You can use it as a, uh, a word processor. But it's still at that point where it's if you have to. You don't want to use it every single day because it just drives you crazy. But it's so much closer than we were, you know, pre-Ajax, uh, pre, say, Gmail, pre-network storage, where, you know, a, a whole big giant application like Ajax Write, 10 years ago, you know, you wrote it in Java and it took five minutes to download. Uh, and then you saved it to like your local sandbox and hopefully you could save it there because you know you tried to restrict the Java. Um, you now it, it, it's gained a lot closer. Uh, the big things that, that Web 2.0 is missing right now is a, a, a nice big solid API to override everything where say from your Ajax right you can say okay I made this document now let's send it to my blog, let's send it uh, <coughs> to my Gmail account and this contact on it through the single interface. And that's something that uh, some of the, the newer platform and the browsers are trying to do, the uos.com, um, trying to, to merge all of that. But where they're not succeeding is that they're trying to do the, the traditional matchup, mashup of uh, using their existing services, using the, the APIs for, for Gmail and trying to merge them all together where really there needs to be someone to step forward and say, uh, okay, everybody that wants to talk together needs to do it this way. Uh, REST is a, a, a good pro protocol for doing that. Uh, if you're not familiar with, with it, REST sits on top of HTTP. Everything has an object, uh, and everything uses the same methods like get, uh, delete, put, and with that, uh, as long as, uh, say, services are advertising a, 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 a consistent uh, level of, obje of objects, uh, Gmail, has a like slash contact slash email address and say to get the list of contacts get slash contact uh, to add contacts same thing uh, <clears throat> I think once uh, more web services start to use a, a very consistent method for doing that uh, then uh, we'll be able to, to really further the, the platform in a browser go ahead Mm -hmm. um, so their model has been win the war by brute force. You throw enough money at the problem, and the problem goes away. So what's preventing them from co-opting these collection of collections, as you, as you call it, um, and basically doing it and, and longer and harder and better than anybody else can until they've won this one again and put it to the side? Yep, I'm getting there. I, I think that they will. Um, you know, that's certainly what they've done in the past. Um, and. You know, it's worked before, so I think that's what Microsoft will try to do to combat it. Uh, the Microsoft does have that dominance, at least at the client end, and they do have a significant uh, <coughs> uh, uh, market share at the server end as well. Now, if you control one end of that, you can make the proprietary extension and hope that people use it. But when you uh, control both ends of that communication, then you can do that proprietary on both ends and lock other people out of it. Uh, and that's what Microsoft will do. Uh, they don't have a lot of, uh, of server, market share, server market share, at least in comparison to the desktop. Um, but fundamentally, that's kind of flawed. Um, the biggest benefit of, of Web 2.0 is that services can interact with other services. Uh, that proprietary let's lock everybody out um, doesn't play well into that. Uh, so I, I think that we'll end up with sort of a fragmented web, i.e. Um, like the IE versus Netscape days, where as a, a web developer or a web application developer now, 
uh, you wrote content. Sometimes it worked with IE, sometimes it worked with Netscape, sometimes it was horribly broken uh, in the, the browser that you weren't writing for. And as uh, this progresses, I think that we'll have web applications like that that are, you know, you must run this on the Windows server and you must have an IE client. And on the other end, open developers that will, will try and write it for both and, of course, Microsoft writing, you know, locking out their proprietary extensions so that open source developers can't target uh, IA clients. Um, so I think that that will happen, but that doesn't play into the big strength of the Web 2.0. Uh, as uh, as this comes about, uh, I think that the, the open standards will take an early lead because, well, Microsoft isn't the innovator. Uh, <coughs> historically, Microsoft has been able to play catch up by just brute force, by pumping dollars into it. Um, so they don't need to innovate and, and haven't been. Uh, so open source will take a, an early lead in the Web 2.0 battle. Uh, now, as uh, new web services come to light, they'll have to choose between, okay, we can go the Microsoft route, which has always worked for us before, or we can use the open source route where it has all these new features and we can talk to this great killer app. We can talk to all this other stuff. And on the Microsoft side, <clears throat> you know, if anybody has developed using Microsoft technologies, VB script, Visual C++, it's not that you can't write for uh, for uh, a more open architecture, but you're just so restricted in, in the ways that you can do it. And Microsoft developers just don't have that initiative to, to learn how to develop the right way. Um, so uh, there'll be that decision that uh, new players coming to market will have to make, whether they go the Microsoft way or the open source way. Uh, and open source will win that battle because, uh, not just because open source is the nice people in the sandals, but uh, <clears throat> you know, open source has that, hey, we can work with this and this and this and this. Uh, so you know, open source will win that, uh, uh, that initial push because they're the innovator and then as new stuff comes to market, they'll get a significant portion of that as well. Now, we'll see a lot of traditional desktop apps, even ones that you wouldn't think of, uh, moving to, to Web 2.0 um, just because of all the benefits, all, all the things like, hey, I can take this Photoshop and put it online, sell licenses for a day. Um, which is something that they can't do right now. Um, you know, you sell a Photoshop license for a day for two point for two dollars. Um, put out a press release. Hey, we've got this new filter. It gets picked up by Slashdot. You click on that. Go to Photoshop. Buy a license for a day. Um, go into Photoshop.com. Uh, make a pretty picture, and then save it to your blog. Um, you know. Adobe would love something like that because it will uh, uh, expose new people to the product. Uh, <clears throat> it's easier for them to manage licenses. Uh, you know, software as a service has just tremendous benefits from a licensing perspective. Uh, you know, they get that continued revenue. Uh, it's easier for them to enforce licenses. They don't have to say, hey, let's sell this one copy of Photoshop to a company. Let's license every developer that they have. Uh, so there's a, a big incentive for traditional software developers that you wouldn't think would be Web 2.0 applications to, to push their, their product to that. Now, of course, as they do, they get to say, okay, let's interrupt with, with this service. Let's say, let's uh, be able to print it out at walmart.com. Um, and you know, all the benefits of, of everybody else. It, it's the same thing where you know, on eBay, it, the value is from the number of people that are in it. 
well, it's going to be the same thing with Web 2.0 in general, where uh, the more companies that uh, are, are producing Web 2.0 applications, the, the better the interoperability will be. So this is going to be another case, or uh, uh, an, another case of uh, Microsoft having to fight a war, platform versus platform. Uh, this isn't platform versus app. This is platform versus a new way of thinking. And Microsoft will try and do their extended embrace, extinguish, where they make the proprietary extensions, but uh, <coughs> that is exactly the opposite of the strength of, of Web 2.0. You know, it's, hey, let's interrupt with, with everything. Um, and as Microsoft tries to fight that, um, that's exactly their, their weakness in, in the new platform. One of the neat things that's going to happen as uh, software transitions from the, the, the desktop to the web is that software versions will end. Uh, like I said before, with software licensing, uh, <clears throat> you know, if you have Photoshop.com, there isn't a way to say you can access Photoshop7.com, but as soon as you go to Photoshop8.com, you need to, to, to pay us another license. Uh, that doesn't play well into the Web 2.0 concept, where <coughs> updates can just be pushed out uh, as needed. And you know, it's another big benefit for software companies. They don't have to deliver patches. They don't have to regression test and support five-year-old products. They can say, let's support Photoshop.com and hope to hell everything is running OK. And if it's not, then we run the patch to fix it. And all of our customers are running the exact same code. Um, which is uh, just a tremendous cost-saving measure for them. Um, and as applications move from the, the traditional client PC to the network, uh, the client obsolescence slows. Um, it doesn't matter if you're writing Photoshop.com on you know, Pentium 4 2.6 gigahertz or Pentium 4 3 gigahertz. Um, it, all that matters is the bandwidth um, <clears throat> and really the obsolescence uh, is at the, the server end, uh, making sure that the bandwidth is there, making sure storage is there. Um, you know, Moore's Law covers processing power and that will um, you know, really take care of that on the server end, but I think where we're going to see the bottlenecks is bandwidth and storage uh, coming up. You know, just like Jason Scott said in the last talk, you know, MP3 is an old technology, and the processing power to do it, you know, just wasn't there when it was developed. Um, it, we're going to start seeing very similar things like that on the server end, where, um, <clears throat> you know, somebody could make uh, a Windows replacement today, browser it or platform in a browser, but without the the bandwidth to deliver streaming video in that from your local DVD drive, you know, there's still very real limitations to it. Um, so that server obsolescence is, is going to be one of the big uh, battles to fight. Read over here. You did everything way out of order. So let me see here. Does anybody have any questions so far? Yeah. Well, uh, why do you think you know web thin clients will be any more successful than than traditional thin, thin clients? clients? Um, well, traditional thin clients have a, a lot of limitations. Um, 
the, the web thin clients won't. Now, I, I'm not saying that we'll have you know, traditional thin clients um, working with Web 2.0 apps. Um, you know, I think that as development happens, if uh, a balance can be stricken where you know, Photoshop.com can do some rendering on your local system as well as uh, utilizing the uh, server resources when it's appropriate. Uh, yeah, I, I think that that'll be the best solution where we can find a balance in that. Um, and with that, you know, it, it doesn't exclude a traditional thin client from accessing it. You know, if a traditional thin client just doesn't have any resources to do it locally, you know, it can happen at the server. Um, and, and that's just something that isn't covered by any Web 2.0 technologies today. It might be a Web 3.0. Um, so I think that'll be a very interesting uh, thing that happens where the client doesn't matter as much, but each will have its limitations. You know, if I'm doing Photoshop.com on my PDA, um, you know, I, I'm going to have bandwidth limitations for however I'm accessing it, plus display, plus input, um, plus processing. So it, it could be where if you access it on PDA, you have limited capabilities. Um, you know, thin client would be another step. Pentium 60 would be another step. Um, and maybe the, the platform can kind of detect uh, how you're accessing it and what your client capabilities are and, and utilize it effectively. Um, yeah, another thing that is going to have to kind of come up is uh, uh, network storage. I, I really like Gmail um, just for the concept that it's two gigabytes of storage that I don't have to, to manage on my desktop computer. Um, you know, it's frowned upon right now to you know, use one of the utilities to use connected mounted as a file system, but I think that uh, pretty quickly we'll see some high profile names actually offering that where it, it is a network share. Um, probably ad supported, probably with a paid option. Um, but, um, <clears throat> and if they do a good job of it, probably using REST or some other nice API for uh, letting other services interrupt with it, you can you know, host your eBay images there or um, host uh, you know, pod podcast links, they're fed off your blogger.com account. Um, so uh, I, I think storage uh, from the network side is something that we're going to see some uh, uh, advances in pretty quickly. Any other questions? All right. Well. That's all I have then. Uh, don't poke me as at nine. All right, thank you. Well, any big code base is just a problem, um, especially on the proprietary software side where you have to pay people to manage it. Um, you now, it, it's tough to have those millions of lines of code and try and do something innovative with it while still maintaining that backwards compatibility. Um, so I, I think it's a big problem for them, but I don't think it's a threat in the manner that no matter what, they still have that installed base of Windows 98 people that aren't going to change. Um, I don't think that their problems in managing that alone will, will uh, attribute to their downfall. But I have heard the argument that uh, the amount of code they have to maintain being compatible with those older apps having a lot of overhead in their process mm -hmm. into uh, even Windows desktop. Mm -hmm. uh. <laughs> One of the things that Microsoft has stated and Gates has stated is that they consider breaking backwards compatibility to be a lost asset. Yes. 
Uh, and you know, that's a big benefit of Web 2.0 apps, where you don't have that backwards compatibility. Everybody is on, on uh, one version. Um, so as they you know, develop Vista and try and maintain 16-bit DOS support so you can still run you know, Doom before the Windows port, um, it, it's, it's a battle. Um, it's particularly a big battle for them because they have to pay their developers to, to do it and fight through it. And uh, it, it's a big problem. I'm glad I don't have to solve it. Is that an advantage to uh, the open source world? Is the fact that you can always recompile with newer libraries? Because apparently, um, source is doesn't break as often as uh, binary compatibilities when you're doing a closed source app. Yeah, um, but from Microsoft's vantage point, uh, yeah, they have the, the source code for the most important part of, of that relationship. Um, from an open source standpoint, when you're faced with that problem, uh, you always have the uh, um, option of saying, I don't want to do that backwards compatibility and dropping it. Um, if enough people want it, they can pick it up as a fork or you know, complain and persuade you otherwise. But uh, I think you have a lot more freedom um, in an open source project faced with that situation than uh, a proprietary billion dollar company where you have such a, a large installed base that when you drop support for something, you, you, uh, you hear about it uh, from a lot uh, larger client base. Well, my opinion on that is basically for the closed source, really their employees can work on it. Whereas with open source, it's open to the community. So if somebody doesn't like something, you just pull it out. Otherwise, you have to wait on Microsoft. And of course, they're going to take forever and ever and ever. <laughs> Whereas, you know, you say, hey, can you write this portion? Yeah, yeah, great. Can you write this portion? Mm -hmm. That's the yeah, advantage of it. But one of the trade offs is that, too, is it turns this into, we get this uh, into a meritocracy where I think it covers the Lug Radio episodes back where if it's something that's interesting, then it gets a lot of people working on it. But if it's less interesting, but it's still critical, then, you know, you get one or two people on, you hope they stay on it so it keeps being worked on. The code is always going to move, it's always going to evolve, it's always going to change. I mean, you, you're never going to have the same person working on the same piece of code at one point. I mean, you're going to have a lot of people that are going to stick around, but that's the whole point. A well, different person can go to a different viewpoint. If you look at like source works, there are thousands of apps that were started, but they didn't actually get anywhere because they didn't have cheap critical mass. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, a, a lot of software development projects, uh, open source in particular, but, but all of them, are, are started to st scratch an individual niche. Um, you know, oftentimes an individual will get bored or find a different solution or decide, hey, I really don't want to, to rewrite you know, all this tons of code just for uh, my little itch. Uh, so you know, if searching source for, source for it, you can find tons of projects that, fight that are, you know, are in that boat. But also, there's the projects where you know an individual has a niche, uh, uh, you know that they want to fill. Um, <clears throat> you know they write the code, it sits for a year, and then it, it becomes a big thing. Uh, Samba is a great example of that. Uh, if you read the history of that, you know Jeremy Allison did it in like 1992, and it just sat dormant for years. That um, he had a need for it in his company, and. Uh, then several years later, lots of other people said, hey, I, Lens is cool now. I want to hook up um, my Windows share to it. And the project took off from there. Um, so it, there's a, a big balance between um, how many people the, the software project will fill and, um, and uh, the time that it'll take to do it. Do you think that like, between Saba and Wine, Open back, they're going to have a reasonable chance of undermining Microsoft's domination scenarios. I don't. Um, I, I don't think that that's the right way to do it. Uh, uh, the Samba and, and Wine are, are tremendous projects, and they do great things. But they try and do the things that Microsoft is doing better than Microsoft is doing them, 
and that's just an impossible battle to win. Uh, you know, a few years ago, Samba's performance just blew Windows out of the water. Um, and, you know, Windows Server 2003 came around, and file sharing, normal file sharing performance isn't that different between the two. Windows Server 2003 is actually stable now. Um, and um, when they did their, their new Active Directory stuff, it broke everything in, in, uh, in Samba for, for managing domains. Um, so Microsoft it, it can always be one step ahead of, of those types of projects. Uh, anything innovative that Samba or an open source project does can easily find its way into the, the proprietary uh, code, even if uh, you know, it's not a direct code copy. But the, the opposite isn't always true. There's, there's things that Microsoft can, that can do that uh, are just tough to reverse engineer. Uh, now it, it took uh, Samba quite a long time to really get their Active Directory stuff together after Microsoft blindsided them and released that. What about like, the software patent you battles? Oh, man. I, I want to rant about that, but, but I'll, I'll re refrain myself. Uh, yeah, software patents are wrong. Um, every country that's doing that just needs to be instructed the proper way of developing software, because obviously the people that are, are managing that don't know. Um, you know. The problem with software patents are that you patent the process of doing something, but in software there's tons of different ways of doing that. Um, so you, you really have no benefits of the patent, but you restrict uh, competition. Um, and that's something that we're done here in the US and the EU. Um, and it's uh, a terrible blow to open source. And you know, um, unfortunately, commercial software is the one that, that uh, has uh, lots of money to throw at politicians and lobbyists and marketing. And, um, I'm not sure how open source really combats that other than, than uh, disseminating that knowledge, which is something that open source is good at. Well, we've got a few friendly vendors like IBM who has the most patents. Mm -hmm. um, and Red Hat and a few others have made that uh, association where they share patents. Mm -hmm. Yeah, now that you know, open source has caught on to that and realized the value of software patents, uh, uh, yeah, especially you know, the, the corporate contributors like IBM and Red Hat, uh, you know, we're, the open source has started to realize that value and, and amass uh, uh, what they can with that, which is a good thing. Um, but it's still something that needs to be abolished. Well, to kind of go back to what he was saying, and I, I apologize for coming late if you already covered it. No problem. Really, I, in my opinion, <clears throat> the battle is going to be won against Microsoft as far as getting it on the business desktop. Mm -hmm. If we can get more adoption by businesses, because people, the old money comes to Microsoft that work, I, I can have it at home. That's the way they think. Mm -hmm. And so if you get more people familiar with it, and you know, we could, the open source community could develop more business apps and have more of a business angle to it, mm -hmm. I think you could really, you could really uh, make a case for open source. But as long as it stays in the, an obscure edge of the community, yeah. Where Microsoft dominates the market, and, and I mean, if you just leave it in the community, if you leave it in the, in the uh, consumer category, it might not get anywhere. But if you put it on the business community, where you got, you know, one one company with twenty thousand desktops, mm -hmm. you're going to, and you got multiple companies like that. The more and more, you know, the more you get it out there, the better off. Yeah, that's exactly how the battle between IBM, um, Microsoft, and Apple was. Um, you know, Microsoft uh, reached the business community first, and they went on to win. Um, but that was a bit different because, uh, you know, back then nobody bought a home computer without using the same thing at work first. There was a horrible phobia about computers, and you had to be familiar. Well, of and it still carries over even today. That's what mm -hmm. I'm saying. Yep, there is, and I, I certainly won't disagree with you because you're making my point. Um, <laughs> Um, but it, it is less than it was in, 
you know, the mid 80s. Um, I think it uh, still has a lot to do with market share where, you know, certainly in the mid 80s, once you reach businesses and you got businesses to, to take over, you won market share just because that was it. Um, now I think that's possible to win over that market share by, by uh, reaching consumers first. Um, I think that if you put out a, a good killer app and reach consumers first, that that will spread over to businesses. There's so much competition in the consumer market. That's why, I mean, you, you've got Apple, you've got you know, Linux, you've got Microsoft, you've got a, how many other different distros of Linux. So you've got so much competition on the consumer market. That's why I'm saying I think it would be more of a, a yeah. You know, the, the way the reform and battle plan is to really form more business friendly free apps. Because the business is going to look at it and say, hey, wait a minute, I can get this piece of software that I can use that I don't got to pay Microsoft or IBM Google Bucks for. And I've already got a community of people that pretty much understand that. We just have to retrain them. Mm -hmm. you know, yeah. Once that happens, you have widespread adoption, then people start, oh, hey, I've got Linux at work, I can run Linux at home or yeah, it's certainly a good point that uh, because the business market is, is more limited and, and doesn't have as much options and there's a, a clear delimination between, okay, we can set up this option with Linux or with a web technology and it will cost this much money versus if we do it with Microsoft or you know, another technology, it will cost this much money. Um, you know, in business, there's a, a very clear uh, line where once you cross that, it, makes business sense to, to adopt uh, open source or minds or whatever it is that, that you're adopting. Uh, and consumers, it's, uh, uh, there isn't that uh, clear of a delineation. delineation. Uh, you know, consumers can be, <clears throat> you'll reach this set of consumers if you do this and they include this feature, but you won't if you, or you'll reach a different set if you don't include this feature, include something else instead. Uh, so, yeah, it's a good point that I'd say business, uh, the business market is still easier to, um, to penetrate, um, but I, I don't think that the consumer market and, and that path into uh, all of computing, I, I don't think that that's closed off. Well, I, I, I've talked to a lot of different CEOs. Most CEOs are very business-minded, but they're clueless when it comes to their technology. Center. But I think if we can educate more CEOs and decision makers as to the advantages of it that you know, more people could, you know, because they're, they're the guys that are saying, they're the ones that are getting wine and dine like Microsoft and said, it's a $50 package. Mm -hmm. you know, yeah, and you know, Linux or open source or web apps just don't traditionally have the guy that takes the CEO out to dinner. Um, corporate sponsorship well, through, yeah. yeah. There's got to be other ways that, that mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the corporate sponsorship through IBM and Red Hat, you know, it's just helped the, the community tre tremendously. Um, but it is just a, a matter of getting the information out there. It's not that the CEO has to be taken to dinner to, to um, endorse a product, but the CEO has to be familiar with it. Um, case in point, um, I was aware of a company that was um, uh, evaluating network vendors and pretty early on the technology guys had discounted Cisco for the networking hardware. Um, Cisco had came in late on the quote and they really didn't like working with uh, the interface and just didn't want to deal with Cisco so they asked them. And then corporate management came in and pretty much said the equivalent of, you know, I, I don't know what companies you're considering but, you know, we see Cisco commercials on TV, what's wrong with them? And people believe what they see. Mm -hmm. um, you know, how open source fights that and um, gets the information to the masses is um, you know, a, a tough challenge and one that it's not all that well suited to, to fight. Yes? Microsoft and 
a competition for search dominance in the future. Um, do you think, do you foresee that that could be something that could very much weaken Microsoft's hold on the corporate world, for instance? I love Google. Uh, uh, in the last few months, I've heard rumors of Google releasing the web office suite, uh, Google uh, leasing semi-trailer looking uh, <coughs> uh, containers of equipment to just store racks of storage and uh, yeah, the global data centers where they just park them uh, every so often at network access points and so they can be closer to uh, uh, the end user. Uh, Google, um, Google PCs. Yeah, <laughs> Google PCs, Google Wireless, um, where they track users, uh, submit, uh, uh, send you ads based on location because they know where you are since you're using Google Wireless. Uh, so I, I, I love everything that Google does just because Microsoft has to be having fits about them. Um, you know Balmer screaming in a boardroom somewhere? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Balmer screaming in a boardroom. Um, the, the question was about, uh, you know, if Google releases a, an office suite, uh, how does that affect Microsoft? Uh, I think Microsoft should be extremely concerned about anything that Google does. Um, you know, Balmer in a boardroom isn't a... Uh, you know, that far off. Uh, uh, I, I think that any large company, whether it's Google or IBM or Red Hat, if they released a, a web office suite, um, that would have an immediate impact on Microsoft's uh, position going forward. I think that they would uh, immediately start throwing those dollars towards having their own web office suite. Uh, I think that they are doing that already. Uh, if you go to the WindowsLive.com, um, now initially it was a stub that that kind of mentioned, um, you know, the Web Office Suite, um, and and in fact, I think that that appeared very shortly after the rumors of of Google's uh, Web Office Suite. I don't think that Google is actually doing one. Um, yes, they did buy uh, buy rightly. Uh, which is, uh, yeah, in, in Ajax, right? Uh, uh, very similar to that. Um. <clears throat> I'm surprised that, that uh, Google has gotten away with the same type of business strategy as Microsoft. I'm surprised Microsoft didn't buy Google early on, or I wonder if they're kicking themselves in the ass now that they didn't try to make a move on Google and kill them early. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, um, things would be a lot uh, better off for Microsoft, but uh, they can't really buy every Web 2.0 startup. Wait, yeah, yeah, I guess they can, but um, if it maintains their place in market dominance, I'm sure they try to. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I don't know why they don't just buy every technology company. Um, you know, Department of Justice would weigh, weigh into that a little bit, but uh, um, they beat them once, they can beat them again. Yeah. Um, so, because I mean that's been their, to me in my opinion, that's been their whole uh, strategy to try to stifle innovation. Is they get pissed, somebody comes up with a competing technology. Mm -hmm. We will assimilate you. Mm -hmm. and, you know, they just suck them up and then they kill the idea. Mm -hmm. It's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's certainly one of the, the best things about open source is that you know they haven't found a way to, to really combat that. They can't buy every open source company. They can't um, you know, convince the developers to sign over copyrights. And um, um, you know, Microsoft hasn't found a, a good way to combat it, but at the same time, open source hasn't um, done enough innovation to really persuade consumers or business or anyone to uh, to switch over in mass. So it's just kind of like everybody's stagnant waiting for something to make the first move right now. Yeah. Yeah. Or maybe Google will come in on a, on a horse killer. Maybe. Yeah, Doodle's certainly done the most innovation of uh, any of the, the large high tech companies in the last couple of years.
Anything else? All righty. Thank you.